They were dancing in the streets as the news broke that the Southwest Africa People's Organization, SWAPO, was victorious. The winners of Namibia's internationally supervised election, an important milestone in the United Nations process for Namibia's independence. On November 7th to 11th, more than 96% of Namibia's 700,000 eligible voters went to the polls. For the most part, the actual voting was conducted in an orderly way. The majority supported SWAPO, the Namibian Liberation Movement, which led the struggle for independence. SWAPO took 41 of 72 seats in the new constituent assembly, while their main challenger, the South African-backed Democratic Turnhalla Alliance, or DTA, won 21 seats, and five smaller parties split the rest. Independent observers also played an important role in keeping the process on track, among them American lawyers and human rights workers. I'm Gay McDougall, director of the Commission on Independence for Namibia, a group of distinguished Americans formed to play a constructive role in the process now leading to the end of colonialism in Africa. In this tape, produced in association with the television program South Africa Now, we report on what's happened to date in Namibia's transition to independence. The Commission on Independence for Namibia had 30 members, including Howard University Professor Goler Butcher, former U.S. Senator George McGovern, and Michigan Congressman Howard Wolpe, seen here in a panel discussion. It got off to a very kind of shaky beginning because the South Africans were putting all sorts of obstacles in the way of a truly free and fair election. But I must say that in the last several weeks prior to the election, because, I think, of a tremendous amount of international pressure, there was finally created a set of election rules that I think really allowed the holding of an election that, for most, in most respects, was really free and fair. And this, the sense of excitement that we saw among the Namibian people uh, as they were about to experience this first participation in, in a democratic uh, political system was really uh, was something that we wish we could kind of convey to all of our colleagues who were not present uh, in Namibia to see the process itself. There's a tremendous yearning for independence, a tremendous excitement about their own participation. One of the things that impressed uh, me most is the fact that almost everybody who was eligible to vote did vote. I mean, here you have a country where a majority of the people are illiterate, where they've never voted before. Over 97% of the people uh, eligible to vote got to the polls and voted. When you consider that we have a hard time getting 50% to a national election in the United States, that's a dramatic victory. And I think it's, it's one of the um, exciting chapters in the annals of democratic freedom that this happened in Namibia. The election is a testament to the indomitable spirit and yearning for freedom of the Namibian people because notwithstanding a flawed electoral uh, process, uh, notwithstanding amazing and horrible intimidation, those people got out, as Senator McGovern said, almost to 100 percent. Some walked 10 hours, some stood in 120 degrees broiling sun. They got out and voted for self-determination. Human she rights lawyer Robert Capp was also a commission cells. member. The other thing that to me was so impressive was the fact that after 23 years of, uh, of warfare uh, and a great deal of oppression that many of these people had suffered for a very long period of time, that nevertheless they were extremely generous in spirit uh, with regard to their adversaries. They were prepared for and anxious to achieve reconciliation. They were just unbelievably uh, generous spirited. And I think that very spirit of both determination and generosity is likely to bode well for the future of the country. With the elections over, South Africa's more than 70 year occupation of Namibia is about to come to an end. But independence has been a long time coming. Here's how the process unfolded. April 1st, 1989. UN forces arrive in Namibia. Their mission, to oversee the peaceful implementation of UN Resolution 435 for Namibia's independence. Passed in 1978, South Africa had refused to abide by 435. 
but under a three-way accord between South Africa, Angola, and Cuba late last year, Cuba it was agreed Cuban troops Africa. would leave Angola and South Africa would end its occupation of Namibia. We have reached a peaceful settlement at least on paper, both in respect of the Namibian question as well as on the withdrawal of the Cuban troops from Angola. A bloody bush war between South African forces and the Southwest Africa People's Organization SWAPO, the Namibian Liberation Movement, a war that had lasted over two decades and cost thousands of lives, was also finally coming to an end. But on April 1st, the plan went awry. SWAPO troops based in Angola crossed the border into Namibia, said to be a violation of the UN peace plan. SWAPO was said to have invaded its own country. South Africa, with the acquiescence of the United Nations, sent its killer counterinsurgency troups on the attack. Marty Adesari, the UN Special Representative to Namibia, had this response at the time. In general, I would say that don't expect me to start passing judgment and blaming people what has happened. There has been a major mistake made, but I think my job here is to build bridges and try to get this operation back to the track. It was less a battle than a massacre. SWAPO says its soldiers were looking for UN officials to surrender to. Instead, they found <coughs> South African bullets. These pictures from the London Sunday Telegraph show SWAPO fighters, apparently executed by South African trained troops, shot through the head at close range. And these same troops, Kufut, which means crowbar in Afrikaans, have remained an issue throughout the process. Resolution 435 called for Khufu to be disbanded, but members of the unit have made hundreds of attacks on supporters of SWAPO during the voter registration process and into the election campaign. Uh, Khufu uh, was the dreaded counterinsurgency unit in uh, Namibia that had one uh, task before it, and that was eliminating SWAPO and SWAPO sympathizers, actually civilians as well as combatants, wherever they found them or wherever they thought they found them. We heard um, uh, uh, a whole series of credible uh, reports of uh, coup food, uh, uh, assaults, uh, death threats, uh, sexual assaults of coup food in their caspers, which is still very much in operation. Uh, just uh, mindlessly running down uh, homes and uh, crops of Namibians uh, and uh, seriously intimidating and harassing uh, the population, particularly uh, those uh, refugees that were returning to their country for the electoral process. While more than 700,000 people registered to vote, including some 40,000 Namibians who returned home from exile, the process was still fraught with problems as loopholes in the election laws allowed thousands of white South Africans to register as well. Ten political parties competed in the elections. The main forces are SWAPO and the Democratic Turnhole Alliance, or DTA. SWAPO, which was recognized by the United Nations as the sole authentic representative of the Namibian people, led the struggle against South African domination and commands the most support. Its leader, Sam Nuyoma, seen here returning home after 30 years in exile, is expected to become Namibia's first head of state. How do you feel, Mr. Nuyoma? Very happy <laughs> to be home. Pinyang Gerwa Sheki, SWAPO's UN representative, shared his feelings about going home. Going back home, it was fantastic. It, it was uh, a time when you were filled with emotions. You didn't know whether to... to to jump out and laugh and uncontrollably or to cry, uh, but it was certainly one moment that uh, I will remember. Uh, of course, I have been away from home uh, more than 12 years now, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was just a, a momentous occasion. While SWAPO enjoys enthusiastic support from students, workers, and farmers, Namibia's whites, who have benefited from apartheid, have their own view. Swapo is dangerous, it's communism. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they're totally communistic inclined. I don't like Swapo. The Democratic Turn Hall Alliance, or DTA, is seen by many as South Africa's party, a point disputed by DTA leader Dirk Mudge. And I've said it 
to the, to the commanders and to the South African government. I don't think any assistance by the SADF will in any way promote the interests of my party. So, should they go ahead with that? Should they continue with that? If I would have been Swapu, I would have welcomed it. We don't want to be seen as anybody's stooge. But recently, the DTA was accused of attacking Swapo supporters, along with members of Kufut. The Reverend Helen Fleming of U.S.-based Operation Vote experienced the violence firsthand. My colleague Walter McGill was just recently assaulted by DTA members in South Africa, in the north, in the Oshikate area, where he was filming brutality being uh, taken out on about 50 Namibians, and they came after him. He jumped in his car with two other colleagues, and they went on a chase for about 30 uh, kilometers, uh, about 100 miles an hour. He said he was airborne and everything, petrified. Found his way back to Oshikate to the UNTAG office and thought he was seeking help. Ran and said, help, they're getting, trying to kill me, and uh, thought they would stop at that point. They broke into the UNTAG office, began to beat up not only my colleague, but also the uh, UNTAG office people. But SWAPO also came under heavy criticism for torturing some of its own members. We were witnesses and victims of the regime of institutionalized terror and degradation reigning in the refugee camps and other premises controlled by Swapo in Angola and Zambia. Observers of the process say the biggest obstacles still come from the South African authorities who have not curbed political violence against Swapo best illustrated by the recent assassination of SWAPO leader Anton Lebovsky. Commission on Independence member Anthony Lake, author of this New York Times editorial, recently returned from Namibia. Right-wing extremism is a very serious problem, and certainly if you had traveled for two days as we did with David Smuts, a very brave civil rights uh, lawyer in Namibia who has been receiving death threats from these thugs, uh, it is very serious indeed. More serious than the, the uh, White Wolves, I think, is the escalating violence, or at least until recently escalating, in Ovamba land, uh, where the <coughs> released uh, Kafut or Crowbar counterinsurgency forces uh, went on a rampage in the city attacking SWAPO uh, workers, uh, throwing hand grenades into high schools, all of that. And that's very serious also. But in spite of the problems, all parties accepted the election results a testament to the will of the Namibian people to determine their own future. There are no losers. We are all victors. Even those that did not gain seats would have the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of independence. And as the newly elected Constituent Assembly goes to work for the first time, new challenges lie ahead forging a constitution, and creating a new independent Namibia. With no party controlling the necessary two-thirds of the votes to dictate the terms for the new constitution, longtime rivals will now have to work together. Now, it's unclear what happens after the Constituent Assembly has developed the draft constitution. It may well be that they'll decide to hold a referendum in which the citizens of Namibia will approve the constitution. It may well be, on the other hand, that uh, it will be taken as approved, uh, as drafted, uh, and they will then go forward to establish a date of independence, which is now uh, predicted to be five months after the uh, elections. So on April 1st, 1990, Namibia uh, should be uh, having its first day of independence. And as Namibia continues its process of nation building, members of the Commission on Independence feel they've had a positive impact. I think the role of the Commission was indispensable to the final outcome of a free and fair election. Uh, we had two problems that we were facing. One of them was it was clear that South Africa was doing everything it could to control and to manipulate the transition to independence. Secondly, it was equally clear that the United Nations did not have very strong enforcement powers to compel an orderly process. And so the only recourse that those of us who were concerned about a, genu a genuinely free and fair election was to try to highlight the abuses that were occurring, to expose the South African manipulation of the election process, to focus some attention on the intimidation by the Kavut, this 
paramilitary organization that was going around intimidating people in Ovamba land and so on. And, and the role of the commission was really enormously helpful in, in really getting, the, I think, the international community to understand more clearly what was being proposed by the South African government as the rules of the game, the ways in which that manipulation was occurring. And I think we helped reinforce our own government and the United Nations in adopting a much more forceful stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the South African administration. Well, in a way, I feel very privileged to have been able to make a contribution uh, to this process. I think that uh, the role of independent observers has been quite critical. Uh, uh, we've been the only uh, sector involved uh, in the process that's been willing to speak out and able to speak out uh, uh, objectively uh, about the conditions and the needs and the problems.